December, an armada of ocean racing yachts converges on Sydney. They come from all over the world, giant 73-footers and some no more than 30. Among them are the winners of almost every major ocean race on the international yachting calendar. The magnet which draws them to Sydney in December, the cruising yacht club of Australia's Blue Water Classic, the Sydney to Hobart Yacht Race. One enthusiastic competitor is cruising yacht club Commodore Bill Saltis. For me and my family, sailing is a way of life. But it isn't a sport, it isn't a hobby, it's, uh, it's a thing that uh, we do constantly, probably more than uh, anything else. I've owned a series of boats, all of them second-hand boats, most of them fairly old. So I suddenly decided to uh, build a new boat, have a new boat designed. And it had to be a boat that my family and I could live on comfortably. Uh, I wanted it also to be competitive. This is the conception of Mel Temme, and I believe that she is just that, a good cruising boat that can also be competitive in top company. Among that top company, the giant American yacht Ondine. 73 feet long, Ondine took line honours in the 1968 race. This year she's out to win again and maybe beat the record set in 1962 by her predecessor of the same name. Also chasing the record will be another American 73-footer, Jim Kilroy's Kealoha 2. Kealoha 2 was designed in 1962 and 1963. Uh, she was first launched in January of 1964, although semi-complete. I think we sailed her in a 1,500-mile race approximately two weeks after she went in the water and finally completed her about six months after that. Another contender, American Eagle, owned and skippered by American Yachtsman of the Year, Ted Turner. Well, this is a uh, converted 12-meter. She was originally designed and built to hopefully defend the America's Cup. We raced her probably more miles than any ocean racer in the world has raced in the past three years. I guess we've raced some 40,000 miles. We've broke several course records, including the fastest race this past summer, and we've won a number of victories. Also with numerous victories already behind her is the one-year-old Morning Cloud. Sailed by Sammy Sampson, she's owned by the British Prime Minister Edward Heath, who skippered his previous boat of the same name to victory in the 1969 race. From the Royal Ocean Racing Club of Great Britain, Cervantes Four, owned and skippered by Bob Watson. Also from England, Arthur Slater's Prospect of Whitby. Prospect was designed in January. She was built in a Dutch yard uh, in aluminum between January and February and she was finished off between February and March by suitors of cows and launched in April. It was a very quick, quick job really, but it did mean we got the best of Erlen Stevens' design and the very latest thinking on it right up to date. Whether it's right or wrong or not, I don't know. Really know. From Western Australia, another yacht launched only recently, Siska, designed by owner-skipper Roly Tasker. Back again from New Zealand is Tom Clark's Buccaneer. Last year, we, for the first time in the Sydney Hobart race, uh, we had a marvellous ride for two days, and then we had a hiding for the next 24 hours. I think it was the roughest Hobart race in history. Along with Buccaneer came three top smaller boats. Wyanaba, sailed by Chris Buzaid, John Lidgard's Runaway, and Bryn Wilson's Pathfinder. She was designed by Sparkman and Stephen and uh, she was launched in August of this year with the one-ton cup in mind and this Southern Cross series and how about the race to follow. She's a big boat and uh, in very light airs we might find we haven't got enough sail so uh, probably be better for us if there's a breeze all the summer. There might be a lot to ask for a Hobart race. From Holland comes Stormy. Owner Cornelius Brinzeel skippered his previous boat, Storm Vogel, to a line honours win in the 1965 race. Another international entry, Vargo 2. The Japanese designed this boat especially for the race. Of the local boats, favorite for handicap honors is Ragamuffin. 
since her launching in 1968, she's been virtually unchallenged in her supremacy of the Australian ocean racing scene. But she's yet to win a Sydney Hobart race. Owner skipper Sid Fisher will be all out to win that honour this year and keep the trophy for the Cruising Yacht Club. Speaking as the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia Commodore, the most interesting factor in the 1971 race is the overseas entrance. Some years ago, just to have one boat was considered a wonderful thing. Now we've got the situation of overseas international yachts in the Hobart race, and we're accepting it as one of the facts of life now, that these yachts will travel countless miles, will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, literally, to get here uh, and compete against our boats. And in fact, the quality of the crews themselves. We've got international yachtsmen from all around the world arriving by plane daily looking for a ride. The club here in Rushcutters Bay has been a focal point for ocean racing men uh, from around Australia and from overseas. On the morning of Boxing Day, Sydney siders everywhere turn their attention to the Sydney Hobart race as final preparations are made at the CYC Marina. Then the yachts leave the marina and make their way down the harbour to the starting line. The Caltex radio relay ship Bali High. For the next few days, she'll accompany the fleet as it sails south to Hobart. Minutes before the starting gun, and there's hardly a breath of wind. On board the big American yacht Ondine, tension mounts as the crew try to manoeuvre her in the glassy calm. 79 of the world's top yachts poised at the start of a premier event on the international ocean racing calendar. Only seconds to go now, and still only the barest hint of a breeze. The 27th Sydney Hobart Yacht Race is underway. Ahead lies 640 miles of open sea to the finishing line in the Derwent River. For every mile of the way, the crews will be pushing themselves and their yachts to the utmost. Every second will count. But just now, there's little wind to work with. In the traditional manner, Sydney has taken to the water to give the yachts a hearty send-off. To ease congestion, the starting line is this year nearer the harbour entrance. Ted Turner's American Eagle fares better than most in the search for the elusive breeze. Searching for still more wind, American Eagle tacks to starboard to plough her way through a bewildered spectator fleet. World one-ton cup champion Stormy Petrel, skippered by Australian international yachtsman Graham Newlands. from New Zealand. Underway in her first race, Melbourne yacht Wild Goose. Buccaneer hoping to repeat last year's performance. With runaway is Tawari. Sydney designed Polaris, skippered by Earl Savage. Stormy, she was built in 1969 and since then has sailed over 45,000 miles. With a better breeze, all yachts are now moving smoothly. Cadence, the 1966 winner. Four wins, two from Victoria. Boomeroo 3, launched in September, it's her first competitive race. Salina, a boat that performs best in light windward conditions. Ondine finds a breeze on the eastern shore. In the race for the heads, it's Bacardi and Meltemi who lead the field. Like Meltemi, Bacardi is a Sydney boat. She's skippered by owner-designer Peter Cole. Not far to the heads, and Meltemi crosses ahead of Bacardi. Not far behind the leading two is American Eagle. Mel Temme takes the honour of first through the heads. First of the big boats to reach the open sea is American Eagle. The start of the Sydney Hobart race is one of the most unique events in yachting, at least that we on Kilo 2 have participated in. The enthusiasm of the people of Sydney, the spectator boats, uh, the people lining the heads, 
uh, all provides for a most fantastic departure, and uh, I think all of we in yachting uh, uh, are most enthusiastic about it. This year's race for line honors will see strong competition between the giant American boats and the New Zealander Buccaneer. Ideally, Buccaneer revels in in the reaching breeze of 30, 35 knots. Given a little bit of luck, and everybody needs that, that uh, we might be the first boat home, but whoever is first will know they've had a race on their hands, you know. Once through the heads, the fleet finds more favorable wind conditions and heads southward. Getting her first taste of the open sea, the Japanese entry, Vago 2. Spectators peering into the haze for a last glimpse of the disappearing yachts are guided by the brightly coloured spinnaker carried by Ondine. Interest in the Hobart race is now so great that passenger liners now run special cruises. Ocean Monarch follows the fleet. Spinnakers filling with a good northerly breeze, the fleet romps southward. The Caltex radio relay ship Bali High chases the fleet out to sea. Enjoying the conditions, like the rest, is Bryn Wilson's Pathfinder. You've got to have a bit of luck in a Hobart race. I think with any luck, you've got as good a chance as anybody else. with the leaders is Mel Temme, but the bigger yachts are moving ahead fast. Leading them is Ted Turner's American Eagle. You know, there are five boats, I think, that rate more than we do, and uh, they're all potentially faster, I think, particularly if the wind's behind or reaching. I think American Eagle can hold any of them uh, if the wind's ahead, if we're beating the wind. With. Kealoa 2 likes it just the way it is. This is a long or a moderate distance race, being some 630, 640 miles. Uh, uh, we get out and we get the opportunity to crank these big boats up to a speed that you can never get them to attain uh, in a short race or a triangular race of the type we've had the last two or three days. She obviously likes uh, 15 plus going to weather. Uh, she uh, is a great reaching boat. Uh, we don't know what the wind conditions are going to be. Uh, we don't know whether we're going to be in the right spot at the right time. I can assure you that we'll do our very best to be there. Generally, our plan was to be offshore at night, uh, but to pretty well go down the rum line uh, the rest of the time. Uh, it would appear that the conservative route of going down as close as we can to the rum line uh, would uh, be the better, uh, which is basically what we did with a few variations. <laughs> Late afternoon brings a squall, and with it, stronger winds and heavier seas. During the night, the wind swings around the compass, and morning finds Kealoa 2 beating into a fresh sou'westerly. The night's wind shift has scattered the fleet. This morning, they're spread from Tathra back to Jarvis Bay, and from 12 to 110 miles offshore. To seaward of Kealoa 2 is Siska, and close behind her is Omni. Her course has taken her 85 miles out to sea, and this morning finds her 175 miles from Sydney. Closer inshore, the Caltex radio relay ship Bali High 
and on board the crew begin the task of checking each yacht's position. From the Bali High, reports are relayed to a communication centre especially established at the Cruising Yacht Club. A computer then provides each yacht's position on handicap. The best ever is how CYC Communications Coordinator George Barton describes the system. The midday report confirms Kealoha 2 among the leaders. Noon we were off Eden, uh, we beat down around Green Cape, then uh, uh, stood out to sea. Uh, the wind angle and uh, wind direction uh, were relatively close. Further out to sea are Siska, Ondine, Pasha and American Eagle. At this stage, it looks like any one of the big flyers could win the race for the line. Ragamuffin leads the rest of the fleet. At noon, she reported backstay trouble, but she's still only several miles behind the leaders. Like Kealoha too, she's following the rum line. A few miles behind Ragamuffin are Polaris, Prospect of Whitby and Buccaneer. Ondine, on a course taking her almost a hundred miles offshore, finds herself in light conditions. Whether skipper Huey Long's gamble in chasing offshore winds will pay off, only time will tell. As the fleet enters Bass Strait, the breeze swings towards the west and brings a pleasant ride southward. In the battle for handicap honours, the British yachts have an edge on the fleet at this stage. However, they are closely pressed by Australians and New Zealanders, and crews are continually on their toes to make every second count. It's long stretches without sleep at this stage. Sunset on the third day out from Sydney. During the night, the wind drops away, and morning finds Kealoha 2 off the Tasmanian coast in light airs. Kealoha 2 has developed a commanding lead, but with the fading breeze, there's little chance of breaking the race record or of a handicap win. Light windward work is not generally a big yacht's forte. Nevertheless, Kealoha 2 is sailing nicely in the relatively light airs. Now, we're designed for worldwide capabilities uh, and not specifically any type of weather condition. Uh, this is something that, uh, uh, to a certain extent, Eagle's designed for and to a certain extent, Ondine is designed for. Now, let's compare Ondine. Uh, she's uh, 12 feet longer than Kilo 2 on the waterline. She's a heavier displacement. Uh, her spinnaker is about 6,700 square feet as compared to a 4,700 square foot spinnaker for Kilo 2. Uh, again, we know Ondine like the back of our hand. Uh, if it had been a reach all of the way down, and moderate breezes, that 68-foot waterline of Ondine would have paid off tremendously. A rum line course for Kealoha 2 has paid its dividends. Behind her, the fleet spread their spinnakers as the race for handicap honours continues its intensity. With three yachts in the first four handicap placings at this point, Great Britain seems set to confirm the supremacy displayed in last year's Admiral's Cup series in England. Maintaining her lead, Kealoha 2 rounds Tasman Island and heads across Storm Bay. 
By early evening, Ondine is approaching Tasman Island. Latest reports show Ondine, Siska, American Eagle and Buccaneer battling it out for second across the line. It seems Ondine has won the battle until Buccaneer is sighted over the bow as they both converge on Tasman Island. In Hobart, just before midnight, Kealoa 2 comes in to take line honours. A drop in the wind robbed Kealoa 2 of a race record, but Hobart turns on a rousing welcome. The finish of the race in Hobart, Tasmania, is just magnificent. Uh, the enthusiasm in Hobart, the uh, hundreds or thousands of people uh, lining the uh, points of land as you uh, enter uh, the river. Uh, I think this uh, part of yachting uh, uh, that you demonstrate here is, uh, is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful tribute to all who go to sea, and certainly it comes from uh, seafaring people when uh, this is received. For Jim Kilroy, a victory kiss from his wife. Then at 27 minutes past two in the morning, Buccaneer crosses the line in second place. She came from an almost hopeless position in the fleet to beat Ondine home by just five minutes. American Eagle, Siska, Pasha and Ragamuffin follow Ondine home, but during the night three New Zealand yachts, Pathfinder, Runaway and Wyanawa, gain valuable ground and challenge the British boats for handicap honours. Early morning finds many of the fleet becalmed off Tasman Island. A northerly swell and a heavy slop makes matters worse. The New Zealand trio of yachts are already well across Storm Bay and sail to within only a few miles of their British rivals. Meanwhile, those caught in the swell and becalmed off Tasman Island are no longer sure whether they're moving forward or backwards. While the unlucky wait for a breeze off Tasman Island and the New Zealanders approach the Derwent River, the British yacht Prospect of Whitby crosses the line just before 8 o'clock. As she finishes, she becomes overall handicap winner. But the honour is Arthur Slater's for only a few minutes. When Taurus crosses the line, she takes handicap honours. But for how long? For skippers and crews already in Constitution dock, it's time to congratulate some and commiserate with others. Edward Heath's entry, Morning Cloud, glides to the finish. She takes over handicap honours, but her crew know that the New Zealand boats aren't far behind. The Dutch yacht Stormy finishes as Morning Cloud makes her way into Constitution Dock. Almost four days after Sydney Heads, Meltemi leads Bacardi home by just seven minutes. The 1968 winner, Kumalu. And soon after her comes Saturnita II and Polaris. The South Australian yacht Anaconda finishing well up in the field. British yacht Cervantes IV finishes. But British hopes of a victory are finally dashed as the New Zealand yacht Pathfinder comes into view tacking up the Derwent. Crossing the line now is Melbourne's Victoria. And then Pathfinder finishes the race and becomes the undisputed overall winner. On corrected time, she beats Morning Cloud by one hour and 46 minutes. One hour later, Runaway from New Zealand crosses the line. On corrected time, she takes second place. A short 15 minutes and Wyanawa comes in to be placed third and make it a clean sweep victory for New Zealand. There are many yachts yet to finish, but now they can't change the top placings. Pathfinder, Runaway, Wyanawa. Her task over for another year, the Caltex radio relay ship Bali High noses into Constitution Dock. The 1971 Sydney Hobart Yacht Race has been one of the most exciting and closely contested in the history of the event. The New Zealanders well deserve their victory, but every race teaches a lesson, and next year they'll be working hard to defend their trophy against another field of international yachts and their crews.